second meeting of our committee, and uh, we've invited today uh, two individuals who had cases before the JQC, and there was some, I know, publicity about it, uh, questions raised as far as the uh, means and conducts of uh, those complaints going forward. And uh, the two judges are Judge uh, C.J. Becker, who's with us, and I think Judge Scoggins, who's a probate judge, uh, is still in traffic, which is not unusual for us in Atlanta, but uh, we expect he will be arriving momentarily. Uh, what we plan to do today is to have uh, these two judges testify, uh, and uh, depending on how long it runs, we will take a lunch break at 12 o'clock, and if need be, come back, we will have lunch provided for the witnesses and the members of the panel. Uh, first thing we have is a new court reporter day. If you give us your name, I'll. My name is Michelle uh, Lane. I'm in the Lane. Lane, L I N G. L I N G, excuse me. Well, while we have for your benefit introduction of the members of the uh, committee, and starting with you, uh, Mary Margaret, excuse me. Mary Margaret Oliver. And this is Reed Jordan, who is our assistant and counsel. I'm Wendell Willard, I'm chairman. Troy Kelly. <coughs> John Meadows. All right. Let me give you an update. I know from the last uh, meeting we had, uh, we informed the public that we were asking for the two files of the judges that would be testifying today from the JQC. A letter request was uh, submitted to the JQC last, I believe, Friday yes, after our meeting on Thursday. Uh, and uh, we heard back, I did, from uh, Judge Patsy Porter uh, late yesterday afternoon. The files will be prepared for delivery to the judges, and uh, they expect they will be available Friday for pickup from the law office, as I recall, of uh, Mr. William Hill, who's uh, been retained by the JQC in this matter. Uh, so what we'll have to do probably is have the judges authorize uh, Jordan Reed in their, in their stead to go to the office of uh, William Hill and pick up the file if that's permissible with the judges. Uh, with that, do you, does anyone else have anything else they want to uh, discuss before we start the uh, hearing? We have in the file a letter which will be the next step that we will take and that is uh, an invitation to the current serving members of the uh, Judicial Qualification Commission. There's at least six of them at the present time, but to invite all of them, if they wish to come and appear and uh, give their comments and testimony before the committee next Thursday. And uh, with that, uh, I think the next step that I perceive are taking will be to ask uh, the uh, group of uh, ad hoc committee that's been working on rules uh, on behalf of the uh, JQC to appear before us the following week and discuss uh, their work and uh, proceedings and and what recommendations they may have. As I said, the purpose of this committee is, is really to try and uh, uh, bring together uh, some good results for a new constituted JQC. I think things have kind of a state of chaos, as I'll describe it, at the present time, with the uh, really lack of a director, uh, still lacking one member, and uh, some concerns about where they go at the moment. Uh, with that, if there's any other comments or questions any members have, thank you. Uh, Judge Becker, since you are the only witness we have present right now, I would ask if you would like to come forward, please. And you bring with you whatever files you have or information. I have them there. All right. Sir, just so we can follow the particularities, I would like to receive formally the subpoena. All right. Do we do we have a formal subpoena, Judge? We um, we did. Let me come and have a seat if I might, just to uh, explain what we did. Uh, in in uh, having conversations, the 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 procedures for a subpoena are to have the uh, Speaker of the House actually the one to sign off on subpoenas. 
in conversations I have with, uh, and I'm sorry to get this information to you earlier, in conversations I have with the speaker uh, last week, uh, his desire is to just, just have people, if they can, appear voluntarily uh, before the committee, and uh, if, if need be, uh, I'm to report back to him if there's someone that we are desiring to have or records we're desiring to have uh, brought before the committee and are unable to get them on a voluntary basis, then we would have a subpoena issue. But the speaker's desire was not to just have uh, blanking, blanket subpoenas issued across the board to people. So I, I'm asking if you'll be here voluntarily, that would be great. And if, if there's a concern about that, we will face that uh, uh, with the committee. Well, let me just let me make turn. Put your mic up is close to you. I think it's on. I'll be sure the volume's up. There you are. Sounds Thank you. good. Um, the reason I asked about the particularity of the subpoena is given what happened in this case and that, frankly, I was threatened with 70 years in prison. Um, on advice of my criminal legal counsel, he suggested strongly that before I can be completely forthright and testify under oath, that a subpoena would be necessary. Um, so with your assurances that a subpoena will be forthcoming, I will accept your word and the word of this committee that that, in fact, is compelling yes, me to come forward. I am also here because I gave you my word, and it's important to me. And I appreciate that, Judge Becker, and I apologize I did not have this discussion with either you or your attorney prior to this moment, uh, but I think we can uh, uh, prevail upon the speaker with that understanding of the need you have for the reasons that you're testifying uh, to have a subpoena to be sure that uh, you're compelled to testify in that sense. Uh, with that background, first of all, let me ask the uh, court reporter to uh, swear you in. The minister of the oath. Now, Judge Becker, the uh, proceeding here is somewhat on an informal basis, and it's been our position desire to allow any witness to first make their own statement. Uh, after a statement is made, uh, you go through the entire process of how, however length of time you want to take. Uh, there will then be a time for uh, questions from members of the committee, if that's acceptable to you. That's very acceptable, although I can imagine you understand why I feel a little snake bit by the term informal. I do. I understand. All right. All right. I, would I will like let you make your statement, please, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the study committee, I am here under oath at your request and at some point under subpoena. First, I want to thank you for your leadership in undertaking what I believe to be a critical and necessary assessment at the Judicial Qualifications Commission. It is my sincere hope that my testimony will give you necessary information to force the JQC and its staff to disclose an absolute lack of any meaningful process and verification with which they conducted themselves in my case and would continue to do without intervention. I am not here to protect judges who have misused their position. It is a position of trust which the voters of DeKalb County gave me for almost 15 years before I retired by my choice. I am here to protect justice, justice from a few individuals who have abused their positions on and within the JQC. This critical look by the study committee at the JQC is of particular importance when a constitutionally created body which is designed to receive complaints, screen those complaints for instances of a violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct, not 
judicial error, which is solely the province of the appellate courts, to investigate those complaints in a complete, credible, and appropriate manner, where appropriate and with complete disclosure to the entire commission at a meeting where a quorum is accounted for, including and allowing for appropriate recusals, minutes should be kept, a vote should be recorded, recommend sanctions to, thank you, and through the Supreme Court of Georgia where required by law. The JQC has lost sight of these duties and responsibilities because of the abuses of a few within that body and staff. Please let me be clear again. I am not here to protect judges or to assert that the JQC as a whole is corrupt. I am here so that the JQC never again abuses its power to the detriment of those who serve and the public we all serve. We are not numbers. I heard with dismay a former director testify last week, between 2010 and 2014, 50 judges were removed. We are not trophies, we are not scalps. That's not a good start. We are not a cancer growing within the judiciary. That was testified to. In large part, we are elected by our communities and we serve with honor and dignity. We are members of the communities we serve. I do believe that good and honorable commission members have been led astray by those who relish being the investigator, witness, negotiator, judge and jury without any right of appeal or correction for any accused. Folks, if I had been accused of shoplifting at Walmart, I would have a presumption of innocence. That's not what judges in this state face when they face this JQC. These are harsh terms, but they are not hyperbole. I believe the facts will show that at the time my lawyers, and I hired two different sets, one for the criminal prosecution and one for the JQC, while they were negotiating separately with DA Parks White and separately with DA Kathy Helms, a complete resolution at that point in time, Director Lane was no longer the director. He had had his pay dispute and had left. Chairman Tate at that point in time had finally, finally recused himself frankly, so that he could be the judge and try the JQC formal charges against me. My husband, my lawyer, and myself went to DA Parks White's office in, I believe it was Danielsville. DA White indicated to us that he was under extreme pressure to have a quick indictment and resolution to my case. They wanted me to plead guilty to a misdemeanor charge of false statements. They would graciously give me first offender status. They wanted me to voluntarily serve four days in jail. Four days in jail because that's what I had wrongly forced Defendant Lewis to serve. Now this is for a crime I did not commit. And in addition to that, they wanted to extract letters of apology to District Attorney Robert James, Defendant Lewis, and one of Lewis's lawyers. This was repeated many times in my presence, the presence of my husband and my attorney, Brian Steele, that again, he was under enormous pressure to get this case indicted and resolved. The ends cannot justify the means. That is not the JQC's constitutional responsibility, 
nor is it professional or ethical in my view. It cannot be the process if the JQC is to regain any credibility with the judges of this state and those we serve. I hope that by giving you the facts as to my case as completely as I can, you will see this is not just one instance of mistake, but a pattern of abuse of power so extreme that not only should the JQC be abolished, but it should be reconstituted and modeled after the American Bar Association model on judicial discipline. That was adopted back in 1994, folks. 1994. Alabama, Florida, and some of our sister states have adopted, instituted, and set up this model. This will not cause massive resources from this state. I am very conscious of your budget concerns and how you have to juggle all that. I understand that. The Supreme Court of Georgia has the responsibility and can call on objective experts in the area of constitutional law and judicial ethics and discipline. Law professors, law professors who are expert in this area that don't have any political agenda or any issue there. The Institute of Continuing Legal Education, they could be wonderful. Now, in preparation of my testimony today, I have reviewed the files that my attorneys retained, and this black notebook is what the JQC gave my attorneys in response to a discovery request. So in theory, this should be it. I have... Let me just interrupt. Also, to tell you that uh, if you're not aware, it should be probably... Uh, your, one of your attorneys, Rush Smith, who uh, I think handled your complaint with JQC, has also uh, graciously provided to us, I have a box here, of that file that he has. He gave it to our request. I'm sorry to interrupt, just so want to let you know that. No, I appreciate that, and I'm, I'm thankful and frankly so grateful to Rush Smith, to Nathan Gaffney, and Brian Steele, Steel, without their exceptional legal support and advice, I would have been in deep doo-doo, to put it mildly. These are, again, uh, in response to the discovery request. There are no notes. There are no statements of purported witnesses to support the formal charges against me or to support any criminal action against me. No notes, no recordings whatsoever other than the recording of my embarrassment on September 8th. They could record that. There are no vote minutes, no indication of how the multiple motions I filed were ever heard, discussed, considered before they were summarily dismissed. No emails, text regarding communications between the JQC staff and not only the special prosecutors that were assigned to the JQC complaint, but communications with DA Parks White. In other words, folks, when you look at this, there's a paucity of any kind of support for the formal charges and not much there for anything else. Now, I have provided you complete and full waiver to allow this study committee to look at my file. I have no idea what's in that file. I have no idea what's been added, subtracted, or whether it even exists. That's why I brought this. I'm now hearing for the first time that it will be available to be reviewed. When you get that, I would ask that you compare it to what I've been given, what I was able to prepare for, and if there are gaps in my testimony today, I am happy to look at that file again and answer more questions. Because this mess happened just a year ago, it finally got resolved. I resigned effective March 1, 2015. I got married to a wonderful man April 24, 2015.
this wasn't resolved till the first week in September. And at that time, I was facing 70 years in prison. So there may be some gaps in my memory because I closed that door, I moved on, we've traveled, we've had a great time and a great life. I have prepared some notes and I am hopeful to be able to answer questions in a very precise and helpful manner to move this study along. Again, I'm here, I don't want this to ever happen again to another good and decent public servant. The process needs to be fixed. Thank you. And thank you, Judge. Um, <clears throat> we, we will go through allowing the members uh, in the process of asking questions, I, I usually lead out, Judge, and I, you've made a couple of comments I want to talk about, uh, which you talk about the DA, Parks White, uh, expressed that he was under extreme pressure. Did he ever uh, state what that pressure was or where it was coming from or why? No, he didn't, and I was sitting there uh, on strict orders of my very good criminal lawyer not to say a word. He, we were there to listen to what Parks White said he was going to be presenting to a grand jury um, and to request the ability for my lawyer to present at a grand jury, which is permissible if the district attorney allows it, to present a statement and to be present. We also requested that that proceeding be transcribed so we could hear what had been presented. Uh, initially, D.A. White had indicated that Mr. Steele would be allowed to be present. He also wanted me to come down, not see the indictment, and answer questions to a grand jury. I refused. That would have been boneheaded stupid, okay? Uh, he indicated he would allow my attorney to come down and present a statement. Several days after that meeting, that was re withdrawn. I have no idea why. Uh, D.A. White could answer those questions. Thank you. Do you know exactly what were the charges that were brought under the indictment against you? I believe after the indictment was returned, I know mm -hmm. that I was given a copy of that. Um, but again, what we did is we closed that door and frankly I had a little bonfire in my backyard. <laughs> um, so I have not looked at that since that time. I know there was a false statement was what <coughs> leaps out at me. Is that what stemmed from your interview by the JQC, the Jamisha date was September the 8th? Yes, I believe that that was a piece of that indictment. And I think we've had in our file a copy of that letter, uh, Judge Becker, which was the invitation by the JQC uh, for your coming before them. This is a letter dated August 18th, 2014. There are actually several letters. Are they? Okay. And that's why I, I brought this. And again, I'm relying on what the JQC provided us in response to discovery. Let me see if I can find that. I believe that's tab 15. This is not easy. All right, there's actually an earlier letter dated July 8th. I'm going to put my glasses. July 8th, read docket number 2014-43. All right. Um, as I have gone through all the JQC complaints and all the materials that we were ever provided, there is no such docket number 214-43. Um, this is a letter from Jeff Davis on July 8th. It references that docket number 
and it invites us to me to come down on Friday, July 25th, 2014. And I will be happy to provide all these to you. Thank you. What happens subsequent is there are a number of emails back and forth between Ms. Moon and myself, and I had copied my staff attorney, Tanir Wiggins, at the time as to the back and forth. We had to postpone the uh, meeting first because I was presiding judge on the first date, they asked me, and as it turned out, I think it's during that time frame that Mr. Davis left and Judge Lane at some point stepped in. Um, so those emails, and I've got that, and I'll be happy to provide you that. The critical piece on those emails is there's no docket number, there's no reference to anything. The prior complaint that they had sent to me that I had responded to was the Sue Ellen Heath complaint, which was docket number 214-248. Well, an eight and a three can be confused. That's what I thought we were dealing with. There was never any correction. That is what I had responded to. And that's important. I'm, I'm trying to uh, ascertain what prior information was provided to you of complaints filed against you by anyone uh, during the year of 2014. All right. What information did the JQC send you or give you or your attorneys relative to a complaint of anyone? Okay. I am happy to pull those documents and give you each and every one. Uh, before I just go off the top of my head again, though, there was a complaint filed in 2013 by an attorney, and it was filed right the day after an AJC article came out and said I denied Crawford Lewis bond. Uh, that was filed tail end of 2013, and that was assigned docket number 192. So that should be 2013-192. I received that actual complaint to be addressed in February of 2014. Right. When I received that, there was no docket number referenced by the eight, uh, JQC. I responded to that in February. I never heard another thing about it. That's why I asked about the, the uh, I guess, giving you, talk about that one in particular, when they give you this information of a complaint being filed, are they also seeking from you a response, you being a judge? Yes, I mean, I think if you look at the JQC rules, we are to respond if a complaint's filed. And it, what I heard the other day is sometimes they don't even send those complaints to the judges. I think the term flushed was used. Um, so this complaint was sent to me. It's a letter that is personal and confidential to the court. I receive it. I believe my obligation is to open my files, my notes, look at whatever I can look at, and respond in a timely fashion to that. I did that. Again, the complaint was filed mid-December 2013. The JQC letter sending it to me is two months later in mid-February. And I have documents that will give more precision to those dates. I respond to that letter within a couple of weeks with my formal response as to each aspect of the complaint after I've reviewed the material. Um, that complaint generally alleged that this person had been in the courtroom as an observer. It, and I don't know whether he was or not. There were lots of folks there. It attached to it an AJC article that contained error. Um, as I always did, we went back and looked at court records, court transcripts, before I responded to the JQC. We did that in, the, in this case. I did not hear from the JQC again 
based on my review and what I've got until May, the third week in May. And that was relative. 2014. 2014. Okay. And that was dealing with another complaint that they gave me a docket number on. All right. Let's talk about the first complaint. Uh, you made a response to it. Uh, do you know what, if any, ultimate action was taken by the JQC regarding that complaint from 2013? I had no information to, to review or hear from. I didn't get a, a pastoral call by Jeff Davis. I didn't get an email. I didn't hear anything from the JQC about any issue with the Crawford Lewis case until I appeared September okay. 8th. Well, let's so, get to that point. I'm, I'm still wanting to inquire regarding what may have been provided to you of complaints by, filed by anyone. And I'm, uh, I know you talk about this lawyer, I don't know what his name is, but uh, someone did it through a letter with a copy of a newspaper article that was, we'll call it the 2013 complaint. What next happened as far as any complaints brought to your attention prior to you going to the hearing, I mean, okay. meeting? The next complaint, I respond to that. There is in their file a complaint by a Miss Robinson that was filed apparently May 22, 2014, and it's docket number 354. I don't recall receiving that. There's no indication they even sent that one to me until after the September 8th meeting. Now, I can- After. After. Um, that was not raised, and this was a rehashing of a complaint that she had filed before. Um, but I don't recall and I do not believe I got that, even though it's, it's stamped by them received. I don't think I got that one. Okay. The next one I got was vis-a-vis, -vis, again, a formal letter from the JQC, personal and confidential to me, signed by Jeff Davis, May 27, 2014. No docket number no identification in the cover letter. Attached to the cover letter was their stamp that indicates a docket number of 248. So it's a complaint filed in 2014 and logically it would be dash 248. I respond to that letter. Who, who's what is the nature of that complaint, may I ask? That was Ms. Sue Ellen Heath Again. who tried to revive a judgment that had been De yeah. dead and buried. Old default judgment. Yep. Time ran out. Okay. Time ran out, and she claimed that I'd been not rude to her. I'd been rude in her presence. Okay. <laughs> so. You we know, if that, to see by that complaint, did you ever, did you file a response to that? Absolutely. And did you he hear anything back from the JQC at any time in the future as to what the disposition of that complaint was? Not, well, at any point in time, that was okay. one of the tack-ons, what I call the tack-on complaints. Um, I do get a letter, that's the July 8 letter I referenced that says docket number 214-43. There's nothing in the body of the letter. It's signed by Jeff Davis. There was never an email. There's never a, gee whiz judge, this is what we want to talk to you about. Um, there's no other communication up to that point. That's the first time I see that docket number. And then there are the emails I, re I reference. Yes, ma'am. And we use that same docket number. We say 214-43. That was never corrected or said, hey, you're looking at the wrong thing. And then we have the August 8th letter, 18th letter, I'm sorry, that has the two docket numbers. Here's my point. From the quick chance ahead yesterday afternoon upon receiving the files from your attorney, and the other members of the committee have not seen this, so I'm speaking on something that's only been so far I've reviewed. There is a complaint in the files filed by uh, 
Robert James, who's the DA in DeKalb County. There's also a complaint filed by Crawford Lewis in the file. And I'm, I'm curious as to either of these complaints being filed, did you receive a copy of the complaints uh, from the JQC prior to your going into a hearing on September the 4th? No, I did not. And the important thing is, it's, it's not that they didn't send me complaints that had been filed. Those complaints were filed after the September 8th hearing, hmm. and uh -huh. they were filed after someone, not me, leaks it to the press that I'm dealing with a complaint. So what you have is pile on. That is one of the things that I would ask you to carefully consider. There's a pattern here. If you don't play ball, go off and retire, we're gonna, we're gonna humiliate you. It's gonna get out there and then what happens is you get pile on. You know, judges make decisions every day that tick folks off. That, that's that's our job. Yeah, I know a lot of the complaints that came through that uh, these judges being removed was conduct, either uh, conduct question morality or, right. or conduct involving criminal conduct even. Right. Going planning evidence in uh, that case of the magistrate up in North Georgia. But I, and I understand your point, my, and I think this committee's desire is to see where there has been a failing on the part of the JQC with its own published rules and procedures that do not comport to what they're expected to do in handling these complaints. That's, that's the you and I, charges. You and I are on the same page then because again, I'm not here to protect judges that have uh, committed criminal acts. Yeah. But the question I have is if they get something like a judge is planting evidence, you pick up the phone and you call law enforcement. That's mm -hmm. not JQC business. Well, remove that judge may be JQC but, business. But, 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 but you, you turn it over to the criminal True. folks, and, and certainly you work with them to, to hopefully have the judge removed, All right. but you don't lead the charge. And, and that, I think, is the tenor of what I'm concerned about. That's changed. This is not the JQC the way it used to function. Yes, ma'am. But yes, there, there are, I have those additional complaints but that came yeah. after, gee whiz, the media gets out there shaking the fist about there's a complaint that's been alleged. So at the time, and, and you mentioned you had the first uh, meeting scheduled, that was changed from a July date. Right. And uh, was there then further discussions about setting up a subsequent date? Yes, we did. We went back and forth. Like I said, I, my impression was the JQC was under a bit of flux, like it is now. Uh, the director, Jeff Davis, had left. Uh, Judge Lane was coming in. There was some back and forth. And of course, I had criminal calendars and matters I was trying to juggle as well. Mm -hmm. So we finally settle on the date, but that August 18 letter is the first time they list two docket numbers. Right. And frankly, I just thought it was bizarre and a typo that they had 2015-01 when we were months and months away away from that. Was it the year of 2015 yet? I'm sorry? There was not, they, they did the filings, I guess, by year numbers, like 2015-01 would be the first filing they received during the year, calendar year 2015, or do you know? That would be a logical way mm -hmm. to do it, right. but I don't know. But since we weren't even in 2015-01, the thing that disur disturbed me then and disturbs me now, there was a presumption that they were going to be taking up a complaint against me in 2015 before okay. I even went down there. Okay. The the nature of this letter is, is the only thing it says in there is the, this is to confirm the invitation from the commission to meet with them Monday, September the 8th 
2014 at 1015 a.m. discuss the above mentioned matters and give the address of, in uh, Marietta where to, to uh, go and then if you have any uh, please notify me give an email here to confirm your attendance uh, and it has those two styled docket numbers did did either of those docket numbers relate to anything you had seen from com from complaints filed uh, addressing your conduct no they did not but those docket numbers do appear after we raised I raised at the meeting after I raised in an email response back to Judge Lane after the meeting and again vis-a-vis -a, -vis a letter I sent September 10th I do have a letter from Judge Lane that suddenly has those two docket numbers on it what letter is that please Judge Becker I've let me see if I can pull that I apologize. That's sure, tab 37. It is dated December 22nd, 2014. Which would be after the appearance on the September 8th date. Correct. Okay. That is the first and only time up to that point that I received notice that 2014 4-3 is the complaint filed by Thomas A. Jones. That's the individual who claimed to be in my courtroom at the time I sentenced Crawford Lewis. Okay. There's no other document I have ever seen that gives that assignment. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, 2015-01 is identified as the complaint by Miss Sue Ellen Heath. So according to that letter, I had noticed back before September 8th. Well, I have yet to ever see a document that does that. The reason I am more than willing to turn over what they gave us in discovery is because, frankly, I don't want a letter to show up now dated some other date that claims I had noticed. I understand. Let me focus then on the September 8th and your information prior to that date. Were you ever advised verbally, telephone, uh, email, any manner of the purpose for which they were asking you to come in for this informal uh, interview? Not anything other than the letters I've identified, and we'll leave with the committee, and the emails. That's the, I never received a phone call, an email from the director, either director, um, I had nothing. Did you inquire as to what was the purpose for your going in for this informal interview? My recollection is is that I picked up the phone at some point and called Judge Brenda Weaver, knowing Judge Weaver was on the commission, and said, Brenda, what is this? If I come down and talk about some woman who says I was rude in her presence, okay, I'm sorry, send me to charm school, I'll do better. I mean, it, it really was kind of ridiculous in my view. Um, but I did make that phone call. I was given no indication from Judge Weaver about anything else because, frankly, I said, don't y'all scream these things anymore. Okay. Was it your just assumption then that you're going in about the matter of this uh, lady in your court being upset? Absolutely. And at that, if that was my mistake, it was never corrected. It was never said, wait a minute, Judge, we, you know, that stuff happens. We all have bad days. Uh, it was never, gee whiz, we want to talk to you about denying bond uh, to Defendant Lewis. That's not what it was about. Well, as we get to the September 8th date the, in the meeting, uh, you arrived there. Uh, did you go by yourself? Yes. In fact, I had postponed 
jury selection in a criminal case and told my staff, okay, I got to get up to Cobb County, get back. I've got my file. My staff confirmed to Mr. Hyde and others and my attorneys that the only thing I took up there was the complaint about Miss Heath, by Miss Heath. Mm -hmm. Okay? I told my staff, I'll be back. We'll, pull the, we'll select a jury by 1 o'clock. I walk in the door. Judge Weaver comes up to me and says, CJ, I'm sorry, I've had to recuse myself. I'm your friend, and I can't watch what they're getting ready to do to you. And Linda Evans has also recused herself because her husband has a case in front of you. And I thought, well, wait a minute. This is an informal conversation. What's, what's the deal? And as I'm trying to figure that out, Judge Lane comes up and gives me a big hug and says, don't you look cute today. Come on in. Let's talk. Now, to give you all some context, I am not suggesting that that was a bad thing. Judge Weaver and Judge Lane and I all became Superior Court judges at the same time. So when he says that to me, I, I take it as that's Judge Lane, and we're walking in to have an informal chat. So Who was it? Okay, excuse me, go ahead. Who was in the room then when you sat down for your interview, we'll call it? The way it was uh, set up is Mr. Hyde was sitting to my right. Next to him was an attractive blonde lady that I have no idea who she is. I think that's Miss Moon, the secretary. Next to that individual was Judge Porter. On the other side, as I recall, Judge Lane, Robert Ingram, and then Mr. Tate. In the middle, there was a uh, speakerphone set up. And on the phone, it was my understanding, Jimmy Franklin was on the other end of the line, and I recognized his voice, so Jimmy Franklin was All right. present. Now, we know the meeting itself was recorded. Were you made aware that this meeting was being recorded? No. Were you asked for permission to be recorded? No. All right. So when did you find out that there was a recording made of your interview by the JQC? After it was uh, shown to me what was not a real transcript. What this lady does is a real transcript. I was given something where it was clear uh, the context that I was weeping uh, was not something I expected to see, but it was given to me at some point in time and the audio was released. Um, at some point in time. You say released, how do you mean released? I don't know how it was released. That's one of the things that really... You mean public released or to release... It was the, on the radio. On the radio? Yeah, yeah. It was, It was again, uh, these releases uh, that, I never heard that shouldn't happen, happen. Um, again, it's it's... To me, it's a pattern of activity uh, that is calculated to humiliate and bring pressure on, on the judge, the accused. You better get off because we're going to humiliate you and your family. So well, I don't know and I can't speculate on right. that. As to the, the meeting you have with the JQC on the 8th of uh, September, uh, when did you become aware during that meeting? the purpose of it? Well, as I recall, and the transcript's pretty clear, and, and you all have the audio so you can hear it, I was surprised. You know, the old deer caught in the headlights type thing. Uh, when they, first thing they want to talk about is this, this is about the defendant you denied bond to, and I thought, what am I being? What am I doing here? Um, that would be what I was told after uh, Chairman Ingram had, had welcomed me and indicated it's an informal meeting, and he says, I'm going to turn it over to Judge Lane, and then I think Judge Lane says, well, what we're, what we're concerned about is this defendant you de denied bond to. All right. The, uh, and I, I listened, listened to the recording, read the transcript, and I note in there on occasion, uh, I think from 
uh, Chairman Ingram, uh, I guess they recognize that you do not have prior notice of the purpose of this hearing. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a very fair statement. That's why I've tried to be very careful. I think there are very good people that are serving currently and have served in the past. Uh, and Chairman Ingram and I think Jimmy Franklin also raised issue and concern with it. And I, I think in large part the commissioners try to do a good job. But I think there were some manip manipulations by others. Was there anyone there as an attorney, uh, speaking out, not attorney with the JQC as a commissioner, but an attorney representing the JQC? Not that I was aware of. So the, the questioning was totally done by commission members of you? And, and by the investigator. There is a point in time where um, he enters into the questioning. All right. Um, and, and I guess I, I go back to what I was stating earlier about uh, Mr. Ingram. He recognized, I believe, at points, you know, this may be something you weren't prepared to, to address with the commission. And I, I read into it, do you want to continue or not? Is that a fair statement? Well, I think that is a fair statement. Um, I think that is a fair statement. And this is toward the end of it. I, I'm a, this is from the recording transcript. It says, the thing, Judge Becker, I want you to understand is I think you've got a valid point on that, that being the, I guess, the prize, <laughs> the thing. We apparently dropped the ball, but, and I'm wanting to make sure from a due process standpoint that we're fair to you because when we, we recognize that the most important thing we can do is to make sure the integrity of the judicial system is protected, and we certainly don't want, I can assume you, I can assure you, excuse me, the, we do not intend to tell you one thing and bring you here for another. Did you feel that's what happened? I believe that that was Chairman Ingram's thought. I think uh, there were others on the commission that thought that. But what begs the question to me is when we're having an informal conversation, I want to get it cleared up. I understand. I'd, I did not believe, and hindsight's always crystal clear, I did not believe, A, I'd done anything wrong. I still don't think I did anything wrong. I'm having an informal conversation, and I'm trying to help them understand things. I certainly didn't anticipate formal charges, much less criminal charges, from trying to have an informal conversation. So I wanted to get it done so I could get back to DeKalb County and start my criminal trial. All right. Did it ever come to mind that maybe I should stop and let's get better prepared for this uh, interview that you were brought into? That certainly is obvious today, isn't it? I was naive and dumb about it. And the only way I can explain that is I had been before the JQC about a decade earlier as a much younger judge, okay? At that time, Ms. Custer was the executive director. At that time, the chair was Stephen Jones, who's now on the uh, district court. He was the chair at the yes, time. Sir. They had called me in on a recusal issue in a divorce case and a complaint made by Herbert Schaefer. Some of you all may remember Herbert. I know Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> may, may he rest in peace. Okay. He filed a complaint because I refused to file a bar complaint on him. So, But they called me in. They had sent an observer into my courtroom and... Again, we're having an informal conversation, and the observer in the courtroom said, Judge, I came down and, and watched you in court. I said, oh, okay, How, how'd I do? And she said, you did great. You were very patient. You were explaining things. And I said, well, that's good. And we had a back and forth, and we had a good 
discussion about recusals and how to deal with those and that kind of thing. And it was very respectful. And I said, okay, I'll do better. I'll try harder. And so it was more of a counseling session. E exactly. So when I went in September 8th, I thought that's what would happen. And well, what did happen did, in your mind? What happened in my mind is I was, um, as I put in one of my emails to Ronnie Joe Lane, I was sucker punched. And I sat there and I tried to answer questions. And like I said, looking back, I was naive. Mm -hmm. How stupid. Did you feel like you were being bullied by members of the commission? I felt like one commission member was so over the top that if he had conducted himself that way in a courtroom, deputies would have escorted him out of the courtroom. He was standing. He was red-faced. Who was that? That was Mr. Tate. He was pointing his finger at me, lecturing me how he knew black letter law, which as it turns out, he's wrong. Um, just being berated and at one point I think in there I, I say can we take it down a notch I'm I'm trying to get this resolved and if I've done something wrong fine tell me but I offer to give them the transcript because I I'm trying to remember a case that had 40 plus witnesses took three plus weeks of trial there were literally, when we started that case, a warehouse full of exhibits. And I'm going, wait a minute, what, what was I thinking at that point in time? What was being said? And again, I would have never shared that stuff, but for, it was an informal conversation, so I'm trying to talk to folks. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to seize this point question, but I will pass it on to uh, uh, other members, and I think the first person we have is uh, Ms. Oliver. Do you have questions? Let me get your mic on, turned on, number 19, 18. 18. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Becker, thank you for your service. Thank you, ma'am, for yours. If I understand correctly, the letter of August 18th sets forth two docket numbers, and neither one of those docket numbers in the letter correspond to a case or of any case before you. That was correct at the time that letter was written. Later the docket numbers match not the complaints we received, but the, I think it was December 22nd, 2014 letter from Judge Lane. All of a sudden those docket numbers line up with this complaint. So the 2015-01 docket number uh, that you received August 18th did not relate to a case, but that number appeared in December after the September meeting? December 22nd, 2014. And that complaint uh, relating to 2015-01 docket number that you had no information about when it was revealed in December, that was a, a JQC complaint number or a DeKalb County complaint number? It doesn't relate to anything on the complaint that you see. The only place that docket number appears is on the correspondence cover letter. If you 2015-01, as you look at it now, they're saying that was the Sue Ellen Heath complaint number. But when you look at that complaint number, the way it was stamped in by the JQC before that September meeting is different. And it, it doesn't appear anywhere on the body of the complaint. And any complaint you received in December 2013 from the lawyer who said he observed you in court and then read an AJC article that has, relating to the Crawford Lewis matter, does that have any JQC or any uh, DeKalb County docket number that's relevant to this inquiry. Let me pull that 
while that complaint was filed in December 2013, you didn't was, get it until it wasn't sent to me until February 2014, mm -hmm. and again, the identifying stamp and the docket numbers located in the upper right-hand corner show 192. So if it's filed 2013, it should be dash 192. That's what later was identified by Judge Lane's December letter as 2014-43. That's not on any document I've got. I have never been completely clear, in that, and I have not had a chance to read these documents, whether any complaint in whatever number, in whatever form, whether you saw it or not, in relation to the granting of bond to Crawford Lewis was anything other than a legal decision and arguably a legal error. I never could figure out why the granting or denial of bond was not a legal error and somehow was a conduct error. I'm so glad you brought that up because my response to them and providing them the transcript, my follow-up response, my letter, my follow-up letter by J former Judge Dickert, who I had to retain right off the bat, indicates, and to this day, that's why I made that statement in my opening, the JQC does not have the authority to inject itself in purely what may be mistake of fact or legal error. That's for our appellate courts, and that's what is frankly a very great concern to me. And I think that's of concern to all of us, because these are difficult legal matters, and, and that was a very difficult legal case, having been a DeKalb County person living through all of those cases was difficult. Well, and that's, that's why I mentioned at the outset, literally we had, when it was first presented to me, I had been dealing with that case for four plus years. There were warehouses full of potential exhibits, tens of thousands of exhibits. I was told by the state to set aside six months to try this case, okay? Which, frankly, I didn't think it would take that long, but six months. And this was a complicated matter. And what's important with the Lewis sentencing we had the trial. The trial finished. I never, except in one or two instances, sentenced people immediately. I always waited, looked at it, gave both the state and the defense the opportunity to present anything they wanted to present. It also gave me an opportunity to research. My wonderful staff attorney and I research this, sentencing is one of the most difficult things judges do every day. I wanted to make sure I got it right. I researched it, I thought about it, I prayed on it, and when we went into that sentencing hearing, I was fully prepared. I was comfortable, and as I sit here today, folks, I did the right thing. I did my job. And if an appellate court wants to tell me I didn't do it properly, or they want to tell me I should have done X or Y, I accept that, and I move on. I should know the answer to this question, but I don't. The ABA uh, rules or procedure in relation to disciplinary of judges, does it require a written notice of any complaint to any judge? I will say this, I believe it absolutely does. What I did in preparation before coming today is I tried to refresh my memory because again, I want, I want Georgia judges to have a better situation. I want the public to have a better situation. And the ABA has exquisitely detailed rules that they have been working on and modifying and evolving over time, and I looked through the whole group of those, and I do believe it requires written notice. This will be my final question, Mr. Chairman. I have been very concerned about press leaks out of the Jet QC. Yes, ma'am. I can never understand whether there's a proper purpose 
and a press leak, particularly in your example of the recording, I, I won't use the word transcript, but the re typed recording of your meeting. Can there be any other explanation of the release of that tape recording other than intimidation of you? Not in my mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Earhart. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just back, um, we don't know each other. I'm glad to understand that you're charming as well. I've been accused of that in my history, so I'm empathetic. I'm more charming than my colleague over here, Mr. Meadows, as well. So he can we can have an argument. But um, it seems to me, and certainly, I don't have the legal training for for, for this, but I I do have some experience recently with due process, it seems like the JQC is taking lessons from some of our university campuses and some of their star chamber proceedings. It's fascinating to me the similarities in lack of due process, the idea that, that I think you testified that no witness transcripts were available, no, no notes were available, but fascinating what is available, that that, that supports their ends, so the ends justify the means in these particular star chambers. But you did testify that there was no, no notes, no Nothing, that nothing you've been able to get. Nothing we have been provided, and uh, we asked for that, and we asked for that from uh, the special prosecutors, Tracy Grand Lawson, and she left the case at some point, and Kathy Helms. And let me just say that I think uh, D.A. Helms was a straight shooter mm -hmm. with my folks and I do not believe she would have kept anything from us if there was anything to be gotten that she felt uh, we should be given we would have gotten it and that's why I don't think there is anything Fascinating. That, that, that's an old story then in these types of procedures at least from what I've seen Mr. Chairman and members the, the next question I, I've known Jimmy Franklin for 40 years and uh, I noticed in this uh, written or this type it's not really a transcript of the, of the right. recording that you get close to the end you see uh, Mr. Ingram and particularly Jimmy Franklin his, his quote is we apparently dropped the ball with respect to due process I mean that's that's compelling and, and very clear uh, admission that you weren't being given due process in that in, in that particular star chamber proceeding is that what you felt that those at least those two individuals were, were getting across I mean Jimmy Franklin's so so this basically said it's not fair what right. we've just done right at the end and I, right. I, he, he, um, he should have been a federal judge but right I have huge amounts of, fret, of respect for Jimmy Franklin I've known him not personally, but I actually came across his path when I was on the short list for the Supreme Court of Georgia a couple times. And he was a member of the Judicial Nominating Commission. I have a lot of respect for him. And I have a lot of respect for, again, Robert Ingram. They both recognized what was going on. And frankly, that gave me some comfort. I thought, okay, there are some reasonable folks here it's going to be okay. Okay, well, I mean, I, I, Robert's been in my men's group for 15 years. I mean, we're, I, I know him. He's a Cobb County guy, and yeah. he's as fair an individual as I've ever dealt with. So when, when he's starting to make these comments that we've dropped the ball and he, he basically didn't get due process, this, this is a major concern. So that, I'm, I'm getting a real feel for how you were treated. It seems very shabby. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Meadows, any questions, please, sir? Just, just a couple of statements. I read through this thing twice now. You should have got mad before page 14. Uh, <laughs> I agree with Mr. Earhart. You get down here because I honestly feel like I've been played. And I think they kind of agree with you later on. We apparently dropped the ball. I want to make sure due process standpoint that we're fair to you. And to the extent you were caught off guard, it does bother me, and that's Ingram. And then uh, Mr. Franklin, 
uh, you know, if we did not give the judge notice of what the agenda was, I think we need to do whatever we need to do. Uh, they certainly dropped the ball, uh, and I think you've been played, you were close to being railroaded. Thank you. Any further, Mr. Meadows? Nope. Uh, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, thank you for being here uh, with us today. Um, just a couple things I want to try and just clear up as, as we go through because you, you have shed a lot of light on, on some uh, bad actions I think that the Commission has taken. But I want to make sure just we're clear on a couple things. As you sit here today, for the years 2013, 2014, and 2015, how many complaints do you understand have been filed against you? I Not what they say is filed, but what, what, what do you understand has been filed? Well, what I would need to do is go back and look at and count with their formal charges that were filed, and by extending it into 2015, those are what I call the pylon complaints. Okay. So if you will give me one second on that, I'll be happy to answer that question. And if when you file them, if, you'll, if, if we can do this, give us the docket numbers that you have associated with them, Certainly. the dates that you got the notification and what they were ab the, about. The, the complication with that is, is the docket numbers changed. Because when you look at the actual stamp, JQC official stamp, here's the number, it doesn't match up to what they later say and what they later give formal Would it be better charges. identify them by person who files a complaint? I, I think that makes sense. And again, what I can reference just for purposes of With counting mm -hmm. is that December 22, 2014 letter of Judge Lane, then director, 2014-43, that's Thomas A. Jones, okay? Again, that's the first time that number is associated with that. 2015-01, Sue Ellen Heat, that's the lady who said I was rude in her presence. 2015-11 by Robert James, that's the district attorney currently of DeKalb County. 2015-13 filed by Kalita Robinson. I did not get that, I don't believe, prior to the meeting that was never part of this. There had been a prior one. 2015-14, that was filed by Joe Newton. That's the gentleman, well, I'll leave it there. 2015-15, Crawford Lewis. 2016, I'm sorry, 2015-16, filed by Stephen Shear. That was out of Savannah. That was a two and a half year old mediation where I was over there for some drug court training. Everyone in that circuit had to recuse themselves because there was a real ugly sheriff selection going on. They said, Judge, would you do us a favor while you're sitting here anyway? I said, okay. No deed, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, so, and I was affirmed in that case. So that's kind of what the, is there. One of the things I also want to point out, when I call things pylon complaints, this is a pattern that to me is, is worthy of looking at. When Robert James had the complaint filed and he didn't sign the documents, his deputy chief in charge of appellate arguments, Lenora Grant, one of my law school classmates, filed it. My lawyers were told that when Ms. Grant filed the complaint by Robert James, they wanted permission to use that in their appellate arguments going forward. She was told by Judge Lane, as related to my lawyers, that that wouldn't be appropriate. The reason I point that out is then there was a leak in the press about the filing of the complaint, so it was in front of the Court of Appeals anyway. Mm -hmm. that, that is a very disturbing side pattern. So the, uh, the Lewis uh, complaints are one complaint of 2015-15. Correct. And then 2014-43, correct? 
and two, did you say 215-15? Yes. So three of the complaints that were considered by the JQC all surrounded a case that was before the appellate courts of Georgia. What was the one from 2013? I know the numbers changed, but I, I think we have a pro we have a problem with the process of of, of the JQC, and, and I want to I want to I want to talk about that in terms of how they have changed the docket number. So, what was the one in 2013? Okay, I believe what you're referring to is the one that was filed by Thomas A. Jones. It was filed December something, 2013. It's stamped in the upper right hand corner as 192. I can dig through and find that. So that, that, that was, and that's when the, the number changed uh, 2014 43. Correct. Okay. After September 8th. So essentially, seven, seven complaints. Have you ever, uh, when, when did you receive the formal written complaint of each of these? Okay, that would be on separate occasions for each of those, mm -hmm. and I can pull each of those and the uh, correspondence that sent that to me to the extent I have that letter, um, again, from the file, and I can provide that to you. Okay. And I'd rather just give that to you so I don't make a mistake about what was sent to me. Now, one of them, the Robinson complaint, I don't see a letter in there, so I can't be certain whether or not I, I ever was sent that. Because some they would send, some they didn't. To be clear, with certainty we can say on August the 18th of 2014, you had not received a formal written complaint for either docket number 2014-43 or 2015-01, right? Correct. Okay. Um, had you provided the JQC with any documentation regarding anything involving Crawford Lewis prior to the September 8, 2015 meeting? I filed a response back in February, uh, second or third week of February 2014. Uh, this is my response to this question. This is my response to the other question. If you need anything else like a transcript or anything else, I'm happy to provide it. Uh, that was what I provided them. I don't recall whether we provided them the court transcript at that time because part of the issue with preparing for a number of these things, the actual court transcript for the Crawford Lewis, Pat Reed, Tony Polk case was huge. And it was being prepared by the appellate division of the Superior Court Clerk of DeKalb County for transmittal. So when that starts to happen, I as a judge can't go down and say, give me the file. It, it creates a lot more issue than you would think. The response you gave was that in that response was based on the 2013-192 filing? Yes. Okay. And that was filed under that docket number? That, that is what is on what they sent me. The, and I want to be clear on this. The February, February letter they sent to me, the cover letter, didn't have a docket number on it. But it's a 2013 complaint, and inside you have uh, the JQC stamp giving it a number. I'm almost done, Mr. Chairman. Take your time. Uh, Take your time. Yeah. When did you first learn about the leaks of this recording? Frankly, I, I heard about the audio leak when I was driving home and listening to uh, WSB for traffic. And I heard my voice on the uh, radio, which is always a little startling. So that was WSB? Mm -hmm. um, how close to the initial this this discussion that y'all had this uh, how soon after that did they get leaked i am and it doesn't have to be an, an exact date but an approximation would be you know it was it was after i had filed a response and i'm pretty sure it's about the time or after i had retained 
Judge Dickert on September 11th after I had had emails and I had sent a formal response and it was pretty darn clear to me they wanted my head. I hired uh, Judge Dickert, great guy out of Augusta, just smart off the charts. And um, I believe it was about that time, it was in the fall time period, but it was well before anything else got filed. And I think those uh, first filings, the Robert James filing was November, first, second week of November. So that's when I believe all that was going on. Kind of looking through the recording here, the typed recording, um, and, and if I'm wrong here, please let me know. I mean, it, this during this discussion, there was never any seems like evidence that was presented against you. It seems like what we have here is essentially a couple commission members um, offering their just posture and their opinion as to as to how something should be done without any um, evidence backing up any of that. Is that correct? That is correct. There was no piece of paper, no anything handed to me, shown to me, anything. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, let me go back over something that I, I touched on initially, but I want to get clarity on, further clarification on. Uh, at the meeting on September the 8th, uh, we know the commission members were there, and you testified there was no one there that you were aware of as being an attorney representing the commission, correct? That is correct. There were attorneys in the room, but they were commission members. Correct. And it begs the question, we're about to lose our sound, begs the question, uh, without someone there as a role of a district attorney, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm recalling the testimony of Mr. Davis last week, well, we can use these district attorneys as part of the lawyers for the JQC, and that may have been a bad practice. How did the information, if you are aware, how did this information about your interview of the by the JQC get to someone who was a law enforcement DA? Well, I believe there has been a disclosure in a Fulton Daily Report article that DA Tracy Graham Lawson has acknowledged that she picked up the phone and called the Cobb County DA Vic Reynolds. No. I, How did she know about it, though? How did the information come out of the meeting of the JQC members to a district attorney, a law enforcement, about your appearance and questioning whether you were truthful or not. There are investigative findings that are prepared by their investigator. That is my understanding of what happens. There is no one else who prepares investigative findings. Those investigative findings under the rules as I understand them are presented to the commission along with, uh, I'm not sure what else it's, so I'm not gonna guess. It is my understanding from that point in time what is supposed to happen is there's discussion, although they took the position any discussions that were had that were not part of a formal meeting were not entitled to, there are no notes to, we don't know what say the investigator is saying to commission member one or two or if there's any communication going on. So those investigative findings that are developed by that individual are then provided to the commission. The commission then takes that up at a regular meeting and well, with that commission, deals with it. Would that commission then be making a decision that this needs to be uh, delivered to a district attorney for prosecution if they feel like something's happened as far as conduct uh, I, being untruthful? I have no we idea. We don't know. I have no idea. But obviously without someone there who was a district attorney in that role, something had to be done as a decision to bring in a district attorney. Would that be a fair assumption? That would be a fair assumption. Uh, and I believe that, that the process then is, is that the AG's office is contacted and prosecutor, a prosecutor or prosecutors are uh, selected through the AG's office. Whether there's any screening that goes on by anybody else, I don't, I don't know. 
I, I guess it, it goes to what I've expressed earlier is a uh, deep concern I have what was going on as a practice in the JQC and the fact they would, I guess one of the main roles that JQC has in Georgia is to counsel with judges if there's something about conduct that needs to be corrected. And the fact that we've had two judges, Supreme Court judges, in recent years indicted through their informal meetings with the JQC uh, certainly to me has had a chilling effect upon the ability of the current JQC in the performance of its duties, which is just that, to assist and work with being sure that uh, errant judges, if there's something that needs to be corrected, can be done. I cannot imagine, as I'm sitting here today with the current JQC, if I'm getting a letter, please come in for an informal interview, that I feel safe enough to go in there and do something uh, by speaking to them in a, quote, informal manner. Well, I don't think the judges of this state are that boneheaded stupid. I mean, the JQC has, has the ability to correct itself, and they haven't done that. They have the ability to come forward and say, you know, we messed this up. We ought to apologize. We ought to seek a review of a consent order that, in my mind, was illegally gained. We ought to withdraw that. We ought to fix this, Judge. They're not going to do that. Let's talk about your consent order. There was apparently a, a order as a part of the, uh, you had already left the bench, I believe, is that correct? I left March 1, 2015 and received formal charges, I believe it was March 25th. All right, so you left the bench, the charges now brought against you, you're no longer a serving judge. At some point in time, the prosecution of this case takes a turn, being by turn stopped based upon your giving a statement to the JQC that you're no longer going to be uh, seeking a judgeship in the future. Is that a fair way that's, of that's describing correct. it? That's correct. And in fact, the criminal, criminal charges were stopped not once, but twice. I what do you mean? I mean that when my lawyer, Brian Steele, was in communication with D.A. Parks, they had presented it to the grand jury. He had decided that he wasn't going to allow my attorney to be present. There wasn't going to be a transcript of it. Before he allowed the grand jury to vote on it, I was literally en route to the Cobb County Jail getting ready to turn myself in with my new husband and my 20-year-old West Point cadet, explaining to them that they were professionals and they weren't going to hurt me, you know? And we get a call from our lawyer that D.A. White has pulled the indictment from the grand jury and that he really wants us to sign this consent order. Uh, in return, I'll get the first offender plea. I can serve just four days because that's just right. And uh, as long as not only do I agree never to seek a judgeship again, but any public office, because I'm that kind of person. So that complaint was pulled or I'm sorry, that indictment was pulled from the grand jury. So I allow my lawyers to continue to try and talk with uh, DA Helms, who at that point, again, I want to emphasize, there was only one person that she communicated to us with authority to finalize any consent order with the JQC. And in fact, I told her that? that would be Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde, okay. And I had authorized my lawyers. I said, listen, all I want to be able to do is sit as a senior judge for one reason. I want to help out the drug courts, and I want to help out the veterans courts. That's all I want to be able to do. If they want to give me a year before I can seek that, if they want me to go through remedial judge training, whatever they want, that, that's, that's all I want. 
Her communication to my lawyers was, well, that's reasonable, and I wouldn't have prosecuted her. Her being the DA? DA, DA Helms, and I believe okay. that she would acknowledge that. Well, I guess then the first indictment possibly was stopped by uh, DA White, but subsequently there was an indictment. When was that done? That was about a week, 10 days later, after we went through that drama, uh, my husband and I went down to spend a week in Florida with our twin grandsons. While we are down there, I am on the phone constantly with my lawyers talking about this, talking about that. He's going he's gonna to represent it. So as we're coming back, I believe it was on a Friday, I had been indicted. And what my lawyer was being told is that the DA Parks White was seeking that no bond be granted so that I would be forced <laughs> to be picked up and put in jail. Now, this, this DA postponed motions in a death penalty case in his circuit because he was under such pressure to get this indictment done. Well, uh, the indictment then was returned on Friday. As I remember reading the news reports about it, it was the following, like Tuesday, it was dismissed. Correct. What brought about the dismissal of the indictment? I had signed the consent order that was a lie but I had signed the consent order that, again, Richard Belcher's on the nightly news. She, she admits she made misstatements. Well, that's code for lie. Mm -hmm. And if I seem angry, I'm furious. Well, my, I guess. But they didn't ahead, get sure. my mugshot on the front page. OK. Uh, I remember the judge had some comment about the, uh, the dismissal of that indictment. Who was the judge at uh, Cobb County? Uh, I believe it was Judge Green. Green, correct. A Ruben former Green. prosecutor. And he raised question about the, I guess, propriety of, of this indictment being taken out on Friday and then the following, like Tuesday, it's being dismissed based upon your having signed a statement which had nothing to do with criminal conduct, per se. Uh, I guess the question is uh, you're, you're being uh, given an opportunity based upon civil issues to have a criminal indictment. If you're guilty of the crime, why was it not being properly then proceeding through the, the normal process of the court? And uh, the question is, you know, it's not like saying I'm making restitution. Correct. Or something of that nature. This is a I think what you have in the the proceedings of JQC is is a, is of a civil nature. I I agree wholeheartedly with that, but they did get their trophy. And that trophy was getting a signed statement that you'll never seek judicial or elective office again. Is that correct? No, I'm, I'm now allowed to seek elective office, just not be a judge. Okay. Uh, Mr. Earhart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me make sure I get this right. This, uh, I don't know this person, D.A. Parks, he's the district attorney in DeKalb County? No, no, he's, uh, shoot. Is it the Northern Judicial Circuit? He's somewhere else. He's somewhere else. So he's, I'm, I'm trying to get this track. So this individual over a couple days is going to take you and put you behind bars in Cobb County. He's going to take him to my county and he's going to put you in jail in three days. And, and you were convicted of doing what? Or you were well, indicted for doing what? Okay, there's an indictment. Like I said, I don't have it. That's not a conviction, is it? Help this non-lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Usually you get a trial by jury if they're going to put you behind bars unless it's a, unless you were, like you said, a death penalty case where somebody, so this little thug, Mr. Parks, decides, and I can say these kind of things because uh, I'm, I'm I'm he can't sue me for anything in here. Anything I say in here is, is absolutely, <laughs> protected speech. He, he, he can't I'm not disagreeing with you. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm tired of this criminalization of differences of opinion, and now they're getting to the point where they're going to take somebody with your service record and the honor that you serve with and try to put you behind bars? That's, that's absurdity. Let's get this 
is he one of those that is too afraid to come in here, Mr. Parks? I'd love to talk to him. Let's see if he has the guts to sit there with you and listen to the people's representatives talk to him. I'd love to see him. Mr. Parks, if you're listening, come on down. I want to talk to you. I'll, I'll show him how charming we are. <laughs> is there a question there, <laughs> Mr. Earhart? No, that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that was a statement. That was a charming statement. <laughs> Do we have any other questions of uh, Judge Becker by members of the committee? I believe that uh, concludes for now. I would like to ask, of course, once we see the record, an opportunity to review the record, if there's a need to, I may ask for your return, but we'll give you ample notice about that, if that's all right. That's, that's perfectly all right, and I'll be happy to give Mr. Jordan uh, so the documents I reference just to make sure you have that. Frankly, I, once I take my little sticky notes off, I'll give you the whole black notebook if that's well, we all. See, I have what uh, Rush Smith provided to us, which I believe, but you also may have. That came from Rush's file. This is actually what the JQC gave oh, us. Okay. So I think that's what he uh, has provided here, but I'm not saying that to be sure, but just my understanding is. All right. Good. Well, thank you so much, Judge Becker. Appreciate thank your you. taking the time with us today. And I, I well, really appreciate y'all looking at this. The process needs to get fixed. Thank you. Thank you. We've been about two hours. I think we're close to noon. It's now about 20 minutes to noon. What's the pleasure of the committee? Would you want to take a break and proceed or wait and have lunch? And it's not here yet. Not here yet. Okay, lunch, lunch is not here yet. Anyway, so. Is that Parks White is that the one? Yes. D.A. Parks White faces felony charge over political ad online ads. Okay. What a prince. <laughs> Come on down. Chairman, <laughs> I would rather go forward. Uh, this. Thank you. We'll, everybody wants to go forward, but what next we have is Judge Scoggins. Is Judge Scoggins arrived? Yes, sir. Can we see? There you are. All right, Judge Scoggins, would you mind? Coming up front, please, sir. Again, let me welcome you and thank you for your appearance today. I want to, uh, as a preface to your testifying, let the uh, committee members know in their files they will find uh, some information that you and your office applied some time back. This is a a uh, letter that you apparently wrote to uh, State Bar, uh, Justice Benham, the JQC, and the Administrative Office of Courts, dated April 24th, 2014. There's also a second letter, uh, which is a letter by you to Mr. Davis. I assume that's Jeff Davis. Yes, sir. Yes. And that letter is not dated that I can tell, I think uh, but it has 421.14 at the top. I see that, yes. That was a copy of an email I sent to Mr. Davis. Okay. Did you get a response to that? Uh, yes, sir. Um, it should be in the packet there with a response, but uh, basically, uh, do you want me before, to give you... Before we go through, I'm okay. sorry, I should have had you first. Let me have you, if you would please, be sworn in by our court reporter. Would you administer the oath? Let me ask you if you would please give us your name first and uh, where you reside. Okay. Uh, my name is Mitchell Scoggins. I live in Bartow County, uh, a little area called Rattle, Georgia, which is north of Cartersville. Uh, I've been the probate judge for seven terms, uh, 28 years in Bartow County. Uh, I had 33 years in with the county, and I retired in April of 16. Right. And I am currently serving as a senior judge, probate judge. Yes. Sir. Okay. And to say that in preparation of your coming before us today to testify, Judge Goggins, we had received uh, some time back some information I've, I've included in the file, so I will go through that again just to be sure we're clear. We have a letter that you wrote uh, to the State Bar and others April 24th. We have a statement which is a uh, 
I guess the email you say was sent to uh, Jeff Davis dated uh, April 24th, 2014. Yes, sir. And then we have affidavits that uh, were done by uh, persons employed in your office. I, I believe one, Jennifer Holliday, a clerk, dated April 11th, 2014. Uh, Jennifer Holliday, a clerk, dated uh, April 11th, 2014 a uh, undated affidavit or statement by Kelly Neal, a clerk, another undated statement by Kelly Neal, clerk, and last I have is a affidavit by Rhonda Clark, uh, dated, uh, it doesn't show a date, it's not dated as a document, but Rhonda Clark is the affine and she's your chief, chief clerk. Correct? Yes, sir. All right. Now, you mentioned there was apparently a response from Mr. Davis uh, to your email to him that we talked about dated April 21st, 2014. Yes, sir. Uh, do you want me to tell the story about this? I do. This? Okay. I want you to uh, go ahead and give your opening statement. Thank okay. you. We'll go into details. Okay. This started back in like January, February of 2014, and Mr. Tate, by Mr. Tate, I'm speaking of Lester Tate who is an attorney who practices in our uh, county. Uh, he brought, he sent his clerk up, or his, uh, I guess, paralegal, to file paperwork with the court, uh, waiving arraignment and entering a plea of not guilty to a uh, minor traffic offense. And we asked Mr. Tate's paralegal, uh, did he want to waive his rights to a uh, jury trial and proceed in the probate court? And she said she did not know, so she went back <clears throat> told Mr. Tate of our conversation that he, she had had with my clerks, and that's where those affidavits come in. They were actually dealing with this paralegal. I was not there. I was either on the bench or out of the building. But um, Mr. Tate came back up later, uh, very mad, belligerent with my clerks, and uh, telling my clerks that basically Mitchell knows what I do, and I can make it hard on Mitchell if he continues to these practices practices in the probate court. And <clears throat> they tried to tell him that that was practice with everybody, not just the attorneys, but anybody who uh, had a traffic case in the probate court had to waive arraignment, or waive uh, their rights to a jury trial before the probate court got jurisdiction to hear the case. And that's under, uh, uh, that's in the code, it's under 40-13-23. I knew I was right. I knew I was right in this procedure. And I sat on the training council for the probate judges across the state, and we train that way. We train that you have to have a waiver before you can have jurisdiction over a traffic case. And uh, this became more, I think, as a, it's a legal question. It was not an ethical qu question. I was not doing anything wrong. I was, I was, I was going by the code. And so Mr. Tate proceeded to tell my clerks that he was going to file a complaint with the JQC, uh, that he sits on the JQC board. And um, so they told me and when I come in the next day, and so uh, we sent Mr. Tate a, a, a fax and offered him a continuance on the case. And, but he sent his paralegal up there and filed a demand for a jury trial. So the case wound up in Superior Court. Uh, Two months later, I was in Athens over at the ICJE for training with all the probate judges across the state, and my clerk calls me and says, Mr. Hyde was in our office. And uh, I, they were scared. They didn't know who Mr. Hyde was. They didn't know the, who the JQC was. And uh, from what I was told, and those affidavits will tell you the same thing, is that he comes in the door, he flips his card under the, uh, to, through the glass counter and said, this office is under investigation and we want to see records. And they were not denying Mr. Hyde access to the records. They were just, they didn't know what to do. So they called me in Athens and uh, we spoke on the phone and I said, well, let me speak to Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde told me, he said, your clerks are denying me access to records and we're going to subpoena these dockets and we're going to shut the probate court down and take all your records to Atlanta and you won't be able to do any business. And I said, uh, my clerks will let you look at anything we have. I said, all of our records are public record. 
there's the uh, the vaults act accessible to the general public and you can come and look at anything you want to look at and um, so they carried him around carried him through a vault showed him some traffic cases printed some forms off for him and um, then my clerk Jennifer Holliday who was uh, showing Mr. Hyde around he starts going through papers on my bench I have a file up here and he's going through papers on my bench and and uh, I didn't know that till I got back and I said are you sure he was you looking through? You were out of the office. I was out of the office and the reason I know he did was because we pulled our security camera video and we could see Mr. Hyde in there with my clerk just those two people going through paperwork on my desk and I didn't appreciate that I didn't like that at all uh, he could ask for anything that was public record and I'd be glad to give it to him but anyway Mr. Hyde and I talked that same day we were in Athens and uh, you know I told him I said what am I under investigation for and I said did Lester Tate tell you to come up here and he says I'll tell you about that on Monday well to this day Monday's never came he never came back I've never been served a copy of any kind of complaint from the JQC uh, the only thing that we have or I have in my records are correspondence that I was trying to find out what was going on I've asked three different times for a meeting with three different directors I asked Jeff Davis I asked uh, Ronnie Joe Judge Ronnie Joe Lane and Mr. Daler uh, finally Mr. Daler says uh, I'll set you up a date you can come before the JQC and we'll talk about these issues and I said okay well, this was a snow day, so it wound up, it got canceled. Mr. Daler wanted a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me in my office. And uh, so he came by the office and uh, we talked and he was more interested in what Mr. Hyde had done, not what Mr. Tate had done. And uh, so uh, he was seen more out to get Mr. Hyde than he was to hear my complaint about Lester Tate, okay? And uh, so, that's basically the story. I've been through three different directors. Yes, sir. Uh, I've never had a complaint file, but just from talking to other judges, I spoke to my Superior Court judges in, in uh, Bartow County, there's four of them. They could not believe what Mr. Tate had done. They could not believe he came in and used his office to threaten to try to get what he wanted filed in my court. And, uh, and that's how Representative Coomer found out um, Representative Coomer was speaking with uh, the Superior Court judges and said, well, you heard what happened to Judge Scoggins, and they said, uh, Representative Coomer said no, and so they proceeded to tell him how this had all transpired with uh, Mr. Tate. And that's how I think Mr. Coomer spoke with you about it, and we corresponded a little over the past. Yes, sir. The, the go back to the uh, visiting of your office, of course, by either Mr. Tate or his assistant, and the fact that they were asking to enter a uh, not guilty plea, and as I understand your procedure is, at that point in time, tell us whether you want a trial by jury or not. Yes, sir. And the reason for that is, if I understand the law, you don't conduct jury trials in the probate court. No, sir, we do not. So to have a trial, if you're going to ask for a a jury trial has to go to a spear court for that purpose. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. you need to have an election known at the time you're entering your plea as a way of determining what process and procedure this case is going to take. Right. Had he not entered the plea of not guilty and asked for the waiver, then we would not have to ask for the for him to waive his rights to a jury right. trial. If he just asked for a continuance, we'd been glad to give him the continuance uh, without a problem. Uh, didn't happen. If I understand, you uh, sought to what go to appear before the JQC regarding this matter of the conduct of uh, Mr. Tate three times. And uh, you say three times. Let me talk what we're talking. About. You made the request certainly to three different directors. Or what length of time are we talking about that you were trying to get an opportunity to speak to the JQC? Well, this started in 2014, and I don't remember. Not long after that, Mr. Davis left, and I think he's the president of the Bar Association now. But Mr. Davis left, and so I started with Judge Lane. And to add one thing about Judge Lane is, is one day I was doing traffic arraignment, and I had two sessions. 
uh, which is A through L and M through Z. I have such a big uh, arraignment calendar. Uh, at the end of the calendar call, there's a gentleman sitting in the courtroom. And I says, uh, sir, can we help you? Do you have a traffic case? And he said, no, sir. I said, is there anything else we can help you with? And he says, I'm Ronnie Joe Lane with the JQC. I said, well, come on up, Mr. Lane. I'd like to meet you. And he said, no, sir, you'll get a letter from me and left out the door, would not even come up and shake my hand at the table, at the bench. And so I don't know what brought that on, but uh, it wasn't long after that that I understand that he resigned, and then I started dealing with Mr. Taylor. How would you make your request, uh, Judge, to come before the JQC by? Email and by phone. And over what length of time are we talking about? Uh, the original asked, uh, originally asked Mr. Davis for to visit, and I was bringing my prosecutor with me and the county attorney so that we could sit down and talk about uh, this procedure. Because Mr. Davis, in his email, I don't know if you read it, but he, he said for me to cease operation of that particular procedure in my office. Well, I knew I was right. But I want, that's why I wanted to sit down and talk with Mr. Davis about that to make sure that if there was something I was unaware about, I needed to know because we need to train all the judges to do it correctly, you know, in the state. Well, I don't have that email response from Mr. Davis. If you have that, I'd like to get that entered as part yes, of our record. Yes, sir, I do. And uh, if you can leave that uh, with us, please. I'm going to introduce what is the uh, group of documents you've identified that I was telling you about. I want you to take a look at this. These are the affidavits and be sure we got them all correct. If you can take it to him, please be my courier. <laughs> I want you to take a look at this so we have that as a part of the record, uh, Judge Scoggins. Okay. So the time again, I want to get some basis of how long you were trying to get an opportunity to speak to the JQC. We talk about a couple of months, a year, well, it, it was a couple of months there with Mr. Davis, and then, as I mentioned, he left, and uh, I started in with Judge Lane asking for uh, a meeting, face-to-face -face meeting, and he never responded, either by email, and we also did it by phone. I asked for a meeting, and he said he never answered, so okay. I didn't. And I also asked for the meeting with Mr. Daler, which I finally got a meeting set up, but it snowed the day of the meeting, so we had to cancel that meeting. But he, we did have a face-to-face -face meeting in my office. Only with him? Only with him. Were you desiring to speak to the entire JQC or not? Yes. And you never had that opportunity never given to you? Never had that opportunity. All right, sir. These are the records. Okay. If you include the email you received from Mr. Davis. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Aubrey, you have questions? Number... 18. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. It's kind of here. I appreciate your time and your service. Thank you. Just to be clear, some of the probate judges, my county, for instance, do jury trials, and others do not on these traffic matters. And all of that's different in every county. There, in, there's like uh, seven Article VI probate courts right. which have attorney judges, and they do not handle traffic. Uh, once they become an Article Six, and I think that's controlled by population, like 94,000 people or right. above, uh, they can do jury trials. And that's, in my county now, since I've retired, we became an Article Six court because we are over 100,000. You never received any correspondence, anything in writing from the JQC in relation to any complaint? I initiated everything that happened with the JQC because they never filed a complaint with me and I didn't know what I was what the complaint was other than I knew that Lester Tate had came in and complained about our office procedure thank you all right Mr. Everhart <coughs> you're next do you have anything Mr. Meadows Mr. Kelly 
Joe Scott, it's good to have you here with us today. I uh, hate the circumstances that, that you ever had to go through with this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about just your experience as, as someone who served right. in a, a, for a long time as, as probate judge. I uh, obviously have a lot of connections with judges all across the state. Have you heard uh, of similar actions uh, the, the actions that you experienced with Mr. Hyde being done to other probate judges across the state? Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of conversation with other judges, and, and it just seems to me that, that the JQC in the past has, has tried to oper operate their office by intimidation. They go out and try to intimidate the judge to get that judge to either retire or step down instead of working on a solution, you know. Uh, I remember Judge Lane and Mr. Tate spoke to our Probate Judges Association in Athens, and they kept telling us as a group that they were not the judge police. Well, I thought they operated on basically on uh, complaints instead of going out and trying to initiate work for the JQC. That's what I think was happening with them. My concern with this entire thing is that the JQC has a series of broken processes. Absolutely. And one of those broken processes, I believe, is that is that they do have investigators running around, kind of wild, wild west. Is the only way I know I know how to describe it. And um, my concern is that that someone shows up at your at your office with saying they're investigating, and you, you don't even have an opportunity to ask what that what you've been charged with is the way I view it uh, what someone's complained about so I, I, I think that's the, the picture that's important for uh, for us as this committee to, as we move forward to look at is that that there are broken processes in place at the JQC and that's something that uh, certainly should be a concern to the general public uh, as well I think the the JQC need to be needs to be restructured basically. Uh, I've got a bad name among judges. I, I mean, I know among probate judges, they have a bad name. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Judge Goggins, thanks for your service. Uh, you. Maybe this is more a question for the committee. I, I, I realize the JQC has not been forthcoming from the emails I've seen. They don't want to share anything with this committee, but uh, is there is there no set of standards for investigatory due process so these investigative individuals can walk into anybody's home in this state any courtroom any public building throw their business card through the wall and then they they get to look through everything I mean he can come out to, to any judge's office any I mean he, he sounds pretty all-powerful to me does he get that kind of a is there nothing written well they have rules that, and policies they're supposed to follow and I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, rules I'd love to are. See we got a copy of it in our file. We do? Okay. Yeah, but I don't think it really covers that issue about the the beginning parts of an investigation. I think the question that really comes to mind, and more anything else, and we can discuss this in greater detail, is the failure to provide to a judge a written statement as to here's what the complaint is that's been filed against you and, and get a response. What's their rules and, and policies call for happening? And in your case, it's a... We don't know what was filed. Don't we've had we've had discussions with uh, the directors last week, and one of the things they raised, I want to ask you about. They said, "Well, there's a question about you having a quote open courtroom." Did they ever raise that with you? Anybody in discussions? Either Mr. Davis by his email to you, or Mr. Uh, Judge Lane with his visit to you, or anything of that nature? Talk the only, about the only thing we talked about is I have a small courtroom up in. Bartow County, and we can only get so many people in. And we have to, to like I mentioned earlier on arraignment day, we would do like A through L and M through Z to be able to get all the people in. Uh, it's not just the defendants that come in, they have a supporting cast most every time, and so we fill the courtroom up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that, that really, I think, happened in this, and if I can say this openly, is that I think Mr. Tate got mad because he could not file his paperwork the way he wanted to. And he tells Mr. Davis, let's send Mr. Hyde up there and shake Judge Goggins up and see if we can't get him to come around to our way of thinking. Well, I didn't shake too good. So I started going back and, and trying to find out what 
I was being charged with, and I never got an answer. Thank you, sir. Anyone else have anything further? Judge Clark, if you would leave those documents that we identified as a part of the record, I uh, appreciate it. And if you have a copy of that email from Mr. Davis and that, that's fine. Thank you for your time. Thank you, too, sir. All right. We are, we are completed with the two scheduled uh, witnesses today. We do, uh, I think, have lunch coming for the committee members. If you'd like to stay for lunch, I think it would give us a chance also to discuss some further proceedings. What I'm looking to do, and, and uh, while we're still in meeting, we can talk about this. We have a letter in the file as a proposed letter. Get my file. It shows this particular one being addressed to Judge uh, Patsy Porter. It's just a form letter, but the letter itself will be the same for the uh, six current serving members of the uh, JQC. I felt it'd be uh, important for us if, if we can prevail upon them to uh, come in and address the uh, committee on what they see as difficulties they're facing, whether it be budget matters, whether it be personnel matters. Uh, and speaking of personnel matters, we do have the lady, Tara Moon, who is the executive assistant, I believe, and uh, since we do not have a currently existing director, her name has been involved with some things and mentioned. Uh, I'd like to include her as a party to be also invited to come next week. And do I have a consensus from the committee that we proceed that way? I think after that, <clears throat> once we have the hearing of the uh, commission members, the following week, I would hope to invite uh, what is the ad hoc committee set up by uh, Justice Namius that has been looking at the ABA rules and uh, also uh, considering a rewrite of the rules that are currently in place for the JQC, which you have a copy in your file. Uh, and also looking at what may be a, uh, a new form of structure of the JQC. With the thought in mind, as we've talked about this uh, process they, they're involved in, uh, sometimes the issue of fairness and due process has not been uh, well regarded in the way they handle their business. And so I think that's important for us to look at with uh, relation to what legislation might be considered next session. Mr. Kelly. I just have a statement I just want to say before we yes, wrap sir. up today, if now is the appropriate time. I want to be clear that each of us that sit on this committee want judges to be accountable for bad conduct. We want them to follow the judicial canons and the ethics that are required by judges. No one here is trying to let judges get away with bad conduct. The JQC provides oversight, and it's needed. But I think what we've seen over these last two weeks is that we need someone to police the police. The opponents of, of what we're doing here today say that we're attacking an independent agency, and when they say that, what they really mean to say is that we are investigating an unaccountable agency one that we certainly see needs more oversight. The lack of clearly defined processes and procedures is astounding to me. And the willingness of this commission to then break the, their own rules and the processes that they've laid out in terms of how they handle complaints and formal notice of complaints before hearings are held, to me, uh, is deplorable. This committee here is not just about one or two judges who've been mistreated, though we certainly have seen over the last couple of weeks that there have been judges abused and mistreated. This committee is about an important commission that has broken processes and needs to be reformed, mm -hmm. and that's what we're here for. I just want to make that clear because there's so much misinformation that's being distributed daily by the opponents who are seeking uh, to have no accountability in this process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Ms. Oliver. Um, Mr. Chairman, now that it's, it, it's being discussed publicly that there is an ad hoc group working on solutions, and consistent with my statement last time that I'm very, very pleased to see that there's some solutions by people looking at these, actually looking at these rules, 
Is any member of the JQC volunteered or active in relation to this ad hoc committee, or is it totally independent of them? I'm not sure who all is involved. I know Justice just Namias. I think Mr. Tolley. Ed Tolley is involved from the JQC, and I, I believe also uh, Mr. Hyde has been involved now. And Mr. Yeah, Tolley. I don't know. Mr. Tolley has been recently appointed Correct. after all of this controversy has come up. I have uh, very interested that Judge Scoggins was able to see on his film, his security film, that Mr. Hyde was going through uh, papers on his desk. I've heard anecdotally from other judges that Mr. Hyde goes into their, our offices without notice, without permission, and goes through papers on their desk. I've heard that before, but I've never heard that there was a video of that happening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, we had letters signed by both judges authorizing uh, our aide here and, and attorney uh, Jordan Reed to pick up the files when we get information from the JQC that those files are prepared and ready for, our, for you. And we're really picking up on your behalf and they'll be held in our office. Anything further today we want to discuss? We do have uh, lunch for the committee members in room. 415. I'd like to have y'all join us there. We'll stand adjourned. <laughs>